Join us today as we explore the Sloss Furnaces, a National Historic Landmark located in Birmingham, Alabama. Also, see rare 8mm footage taken during the time of operation. This site here, this is Sloss Furnaces National Historic Landmark. The site started making iron in 1882 and okay. stopped making iron in 1970, fully shut down in 1971, so we have a lot of history here, a lot of stuff that we could talk about. Okay, great. Well, let's get started. All right. Hey guys, this is William with Exploring History. This channel is all about rediscovering history. If this is something that you're interested in, make sure you, you subscribe to this channel and give it a thumbs up. But before you do that, let's get this video started. Today, we will be staying close to our home base right here in Birmingham, Alabama to explore the Sloss Furnaces, a National Historic Landmark. Sloss is currently serving as one-of-a-kind museum of industry and hosts a nationally recognized metal arts program. It also serves as a concert and festival venue. But what was Sloss before that? This site was created in 1881 as a company, the Sloss Furnace Company, created by James Withers Sloss, where we get the name Sloss Furnaces from him, James Withers Sloss. And, and he had a brother, Max Sloss. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And James Withers Sloss is very important to Birmingham as a whole. So he helped bring railroads to this area and of course helped start this company, which was the second iron furnace company built in Birmingham's history. And he was a great businessman. I mean, that's yes. really, I mean, he really could understand where he could make money. And this was a, one of those opportunities. And it's really helped boom Birmingham's industry because the first furnaces in Birmingham were called the Alice Furnaces. And they were okay. on the other end of town where the Golden Flake factory is today. Um, they were the first in 1879. This site was the second, 1881. By 1890, there were 28 furnaces and blasts around the city area. So this really helped kickstart industry in Birmingham, really making Birmingham possible. Even though this site, and like we just said, the company was created in 1881, nothing remains really from that era. Just like with any technology, sure. we upgraded and modernized over the years. Pro almost everything that we're seeing today was built after 1900, with most everything from around the 1920s era. So we are a 20th century blast furnace site here. James Sloss retired in 1886 and sold the company to a group of investors, largely from Richmond, Virginia that had greater access to funding. In the process, Sloss Furnace Company reorganized as the Sloss Iron and Steel Company, who guided it through the period of rapid expansion. The company reorganized in 1899 as Sloss Sheffield Steel and Iron, although it was never to make steel. With the acquisition of additional furnaces and extensive mineral lands in northern Alabama, Sloss Sheffield became the second largest merchant pig iron company in the Birmingham district. We're starting to get into the actual furnace site itself now, where we're passing by the number two furnace, and we're getting into kind of the heart of all the equipment that helps make the furnaces run. Because of course, if you have a blast furnace, really all you need to make iron is just heat, sure. iron ore, and a flux, which was limestone or dolomite. Uh, but all this equipment on the inside of the furnace site helps make it more efficient and make it easier to make iron and make a lot more iron. So we have things like these tall silo tower looking things. These are called hot blast stoves, which would preheat air to about 1200 degrees, pumping that super hot air into the furnace to help heat the furnace up to 3800 degrees that they like to run it at in order to make iron at a massive scale. Things. Because this site did run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So as some, some things needed to be repaired, you had to do that while the site was operational. So it was a constant process of main, maintenance, repair, and operation all at the same time. Wow. So how many people at one time were working here? Yeah, so that's a great question. So if you look in the early years of Sloss, we needed about 250 men to run the site 24-7. So again, ran 24-7, needed about 250 men. But this job was very difficult and very dangerous work, especially in the early years of Sloss. And so turnover was very, very high. So they're always having to replace men that just quit and just wouldn't show up. And so uh, in the early years of Sloss, they, uh, actually James Withers Sloss said that 
For the 250 jobs, they needed to hire about 560 over the course of a month to do the work of the 250 jobs because turnover was so incredibly high. All right, so what we're walking in between here are our boilers. As you can imagine from the name, they boiled water and created steam, and our site ran off of steam power. So almost every machine here ran off of steam power. Those that didn't ran off of electricity, which was made in our powerhouse using steam power. So kind of just gives you an idea that this site really was very self-sufficient. We were doing everything in-house that we needed to run the site. Uh, but this also gives a good example of some of the working conditions as men are having to work right next to these boilers, shoveling coal in all day long. Very hot job, of course, difficult work. And a lot of areas on this site were so hot that men would have to eat salt tablets throughout the day so they wouldn't pass out from the heat. In 1981, Schloss received the designation of National Historic Landmark and in 1983 opened as a museum. I asked Ty what made Schloss different from other museums in the United States. This is the only museum like it in the country where okay. it's a 20th century blast furnace site that people can walk through and explore on their own. There's other preservation of this era of furnace and this type of furnace, but they're preserved to be able to walk around the outside or have special guided tour access only, and they have a big museum building where we are the only one in the country where people are welcome to come and explore and, like we just said, stand right in the steps of where people used to work, which is really cool. It's almost like traveling back in time. Exactly, exactly. That is amazing. Yeah, so we're going to be going into our blowing engine building. Uh, this is some of the, the most unique pieces of equipment that we have here at Sloss. Um, but this is also basically the lungs of the site. This is what's breathing the air into the furnace, which makes it a blast furnace. A blast furnace, blast refers to the air that's being pumped into a furnace. So, so this is where the air came from, is our blowing engine building. All right, let's check it out. All right. So basically these two Ingersoll Rand turbo blowers, they have two sections to each one. You have the steam turbine section, which is actually making the machine run, and then the air compression section, which is compressing the air and pushing it out to the stoves. Yes. We have the steam turbine section open on this side, where basically the steam is going, moving those, those wheels, basically those fans almost, in order to make the machine actually run. And of course, all the piping is below where the steam is coming in and the air is coming out and things like that. And then on this turbo blower here, we can see more the air compression side of things. So uh, this side, the, the steam turbine is, is sealed up while the air compression chamber is, um, is, is lifted up. So you can actually see the channels of how that air is being pr um, compressed inside of this, these machines. And from what we've been told, these are two of the last Ingersoll Rand turbo blowers of this era left in the United States. This one and the one that we mm -hmm. just passed. Right. That is amazing. What we're walking into here is the original blowing engine building. It's also the oldest building on site, built in 1902, and houses eight of these big flywheel piston blowers, where these wheels are 20 feet across. They're connected to 30-foot tall pistons. So basically, the piston is moved up and down using steam pressure, as well as a vacuum system to move it up and down. The wheels are there to regulate the speed of the piston. As that piston is moving up and down, that's what's pressurizing and pushing the air out into the stoves originally. And like I said, this, is, this building was 1902. All of these machines were brought in 1902 to 1905, so, so well over 100 years old at this point. Whenever they shut them off, if any of the pistons stopped at dead center, which is basically right at the top of the chamber, you'd have to move it off of dead center to start that vacuum system properly. Well, the men couldn't move it by hand, so we have our giant wrench here which is a one ton wrench, it weighs 2,000 pounds. It is solid iron. This was used by a machine. So no person ever used this wrench, it was used by a machine. The machine would move the wrench into place around one of the prongs of the wheel, and then the men would hit the end of the wrench with sledgehammers until the wrench moved the wheel, moving the piston to get these restarted. Talk about labor. Exactly, exactly. And this is one of my favorite areas of sauce because yes. all eight of these machines were replaced by those two turbo blowers. So these two did the work of all of these. And so within 50 years, we can see that change of technology and the change of labor just and the change feet. of efficiency. Exactly, just within 20 feet of each other, which is really, really cool to be able to see that history right here in one place. As we continue to walk to the next location, 
Ty told me what made Birmingham, Alabama such an important player in the iron industry during the 20th century. Now, one fortunate thing of Birmingham when it comes to the history of industry is, of course, Birmingham was pretty late to the industrial game, right? Okay. Birmingham was not a city until 1871, which is post-Civil right, yep. War, and which means that America had been making iron and steel for a long time before Birmingham was sure. created. So a lot of this equipment, a lot of this technology was already pretty much perfected by the time Birmingham came around. All we really had to do is just tweak it in order to make it fit with the southern materials that are here in this area, the iron ore, limestone, and coal that's found in our area, which is really, that's the reason Birmingham exists because those three ingredients are all found right here naturally in the ground within about 15 to 30 miles of each other. And this is one of the only places in the world they're all found this close together. And that's the only reason they started the city was to take advantage of these rocks, these minerals here to turn them into iron. So this is number one furnace. Yep, this is the number one furnace and we're standing right here at the base. Um, what we're kind of can see here at the furnace is you see this big pipe going around the base here or right above the base. This is called the bustle pipe or the wind belt. Basically, this is where the hot air that's coming from the stoves is coming in and then going into the furnace through the tweers, which we can see these little spouts going into the furnace there. That's where that 1200 degree air is being pumped in. And that's the hottest part of the furnace where that 1200 degree air is meaning the burning coke, that pure coal that's on the inside of the furnace. So 3,800 degrees would have been right on the inside of the furnace here whenever this was in operation, which is why you see all those little pipes, like I mentioned earlier, the water being pumped in between to help keep everything cool so the whole furnace doesn't melt and fall over. Here at the front of the furnace, called the iron notch, they would open that up. It's kind of on the other side of this concrete block here. They would open that up once every four hours or so and originally let the iron flow into the floor itself. So this floor that we're standing on used to be a compact sand all the way down to the end of the shed. The men would dig a design into the ground in order to make the bars of iron, basically make the mold in the ground. The design they dug was one line straight down the middle. Off this main line, they dug out secondary lines coming off the side of the main line all the way down. Off these secondary lines, they, they dig off slots just like this going all the way down. And so it's kind of like an ice cube tray sunk into the ground. The liquid iron would flow out, fill up this design, cool into a solid bar form, and then that's how they used to make the bars of iron. This process is older than sloths, but how they came up with the name pig iron, they thought the bars that looked like this looked like piglets feeding from the mother pig. So that's why they called it pig iron. But this iron will be flowing out of the furnace at about 3000 degrees. So incredibly hot temperatures is filling up the floor, made it of course very hot, very difficult work, dangerous work, having to, to do this by hand. The men would have to break the bars off using sledgehammers. And then once they cooled to, to be able to handle, pick them up by hand and load them into carts. And at this time, the bars would weigh about 100 pounds each. So very, very difficult work uh, working inside the shed here. What we're looking at here, these are some of the old hand tools that the men used to use when everything was done by, more by hand. And of course, these are made out of iron, so they are very, very heavy tools. And the key thing about these tools, they're so long, and the men would have to use them from the end of the tool, not from the middle, to try to stay away from that hot iron as much as possible. Because again, that iron is about 3,000 degrees and it is sure. very hot to work next to. So having to not only pick up this heavy tool, but pick it up from just one end versus the middle just again, just shows how strong the men had to be in order to work in this kind of industry. My team couldn't resist, and they had to try for themselves. No way. Come on, frog boy, you're young. I can't, I, unless I go in the middle. But he said they held from the end, right? Yeah. It's like right here. Uh, yeah, no. In the late 1930s, World War II expanded the market for iron and steel and created jobs for Birmingham workers. By 1941, when America entered the war, Nearly half the labor force was employed by the iron and steel and mining industries. More than two-thirds of the industry's workers were African-American. So we're going into the stock tunnel, yes. correct? Okay. Yes. So what is the stock tunnel? Yeah, the stock tunnel is 
one part of the loading system of getting the ingredients into the furnace, which you loaded the furnaces at the top. And of course, stock is just the name for the ingredients going in. Uh, the stock tunnel is where the men would work underground and basically right below the stock trestle, which is just a train platform. Trains would pull up onto the platform, dump the ingredients down right above the tunnel. Inside the tunnel, men would open chutes to let the ingredients slide down and onto a scale car, which would weigh them to get the right ratios, and then load up the skip hoist, which is just a diagonal thing coming off the top of the furnace, which has buckets on the other side to carry those ingredients from the tunnel up and into the top of the furnace. So this is the stock tunnel. This is where men would work, basically. You have the scale car here. The chutes would be connected to the bins above us. So the storage bins is where all the ingredients were stored on site just above us. The chutes would let the ingredients fall onto the scale car, which would weigh them, then take them to the point uh, right, right at the base of the skip hoist to load those buckets up. So how far is this tunnel going back? This whole tunnel is about 250 yards. It's just okay. a tube in the ground that doesn't go anywhere other than that. It just has staircases out. Because again, this is just the loading process. They built it below to try to use gravity as much as possible to get the ingredients onto the scale car instead of having to use the effort to pick them up and onto a scale car, just let gravity do the work. All right, so we're standing next to the skip hoist here. And of course, the skip hoist, like I said, you had the two buckets up there. The buckets would just be carrying the ingredients from the tunnel where they'd be dumped, uh, the ingredients would be dumped from the scale car directly into the buckets and then carried up to the top and then dumped into the furnace. And these worked as counterbalance to each other. So they were constantly loading the furnace all day long. But um, this was, again, kind of like that same theme, modern way versus old way. The old way, the men would have to just ride an elevator next to the furnace up to the top and shovel the ingredients in by hand, which of course, difficult and dangerous. These machines made it a lot safer, a lot easier. Because wow. again, you have machines doing that work for the sure. men. Sloss has seen the beginnings of Birmingham, the Magic City, two world wars, the Civil Rights Movement, and the Industrial Revolution. It has stood the test of time and continues to reinvent itself, even to this day. If walls could talk, what are the stories this place could tell? If you want to learn more about Sloss Furnace's history, current events, or even programs that Sloss is offering, make sure you click the link below. I can't wait to see you again when we explore history.